and it's kind of a, a dumb game, but <laughs> just it's it's not a it's not a Halo type game. It's like it's Puppeteer, not... kind of right. You're... Yeah, so you just kind of point where you want your character to go, but it's a, a kind of a novel way to lead a, a character around, and you're going through a maze, and there's zombies that jump out at you, and it's multiplayer, so a bunch of people are sitting around the table, but they would come in and they would play for hours, and we were trying to do real work. And <laughs> Get out of my system, I'm trying to work. Yeah, they, they'd play it for hours and hours, and, uh, I, and even those prototypes were really heavy, and uh, no one was having trouble with, like, motion sickness or headaches or anything like that so um, but, certainly been tested for hours let's say you're the dungeon master and you want to create a map for people to walk through what's the interface you use to set all this up before you lay the mat out and everybody plays so we certainly haven't explored every way that you can do input the wand is one way that you could potentially put things down um, actually putting physical props down you could have a prop that we're tracking which is maybe a wall piece, and you just put it down like Legos, and you put uh -huh. down your... So you put down these physical pieces, and that would make your your terrain. And then your players could either use a uh, synthetic character to go through, or they could use a real character. Uh, playing D&D &D, uh, over remote distance is possible with this. So potentially, you know, dungeon master sitting at his house and then everyone else could sit around a table somewhere else or in the privacy of their home and when you put your figurine down uh, an avatar of your figurine shows up on everyone else's um, play surface oh, in exactly. their house yeah I mean it's, <laughs> it's awesome well uh, real time strategy they're talking about in chat there's a lot of I would think potential for this to be made for definite games are you thinking about integrating it with consoles in any way what's the the goal it's a little early but we're very excited about PlayStation 4 and the announcement actually today or recently that unity is going to be on uh, mm -hmm. Xbox so the way we envision using these glasses is that the glasses we think we can get a starter kit that gets you the wand and a starter surface of course people are going to want to opt for their giant dungeon master version of it <laughs> um, uh, $200 is what we're thinking we can do, get you started with glasses and a surface and a wand. And it would also do the figurine tracking, um, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I should qualify that, maybe. Um, we're, we're working on getting the price down on the figurine tracker, so that might be yeah, a little extra. But, um, so that would be the cost. You'd hook it up to cell phones, so that's why we're going for Unity, so you can hook it up mm. to cell phones. Um, we see um, Android is like the first path for us. Of course, you can hook it up to your PC. That's where we're doing all of our development now, um, but that's kind of inconvenient bringing a laptop in. Uh, good thing is you can run multiple glasses off one PC, so you can oh, run two, okay. two, two and three glasses off one PC with no problem. So. Um, could you see That's this being like on the, I mean, you could almost make like a little virtual room for yourself where you're, you have, you know, all of this, like a holodeck, essentially. Well, certainly, yeah. So there's a lot of other applications that I haven't described. I've been hyper-focusing on the, the figurine stuff because that's where we're working right now. But um, we we took our prototypes to Maker Faire ahead of schedule, ahead of our July, which is I'm so proud of, and we showed it to thousands of people at Maker Faire. There was an hour-long wait, and what Ooh. people got to see was the block game that I already described, where you could take the wand and just bash blocks, or you could pull blocks out and stuff, which people were enamored with that for some reason. And then um, we made a flight simulator, which was a simple, like, Minecraft-looking voxel flight simulator, where you just took a piece of this surface and you... Uh, it was just a semicircular like piece of cardboard that sat on a table, and then wherever your head pointed, your your plane would fly. Hmm. So you just point your nose where you want to fly. So because um, our tracking is so precise, you get this other piece of input that people really haven't been able to use much um, up to this point. So flight simulators are something that you could do is just like setting up a little cardboard with this material on it. Um, another experience that we showed was the very early uh, card-based game that we, um, yes. we put two cards down. You have two characters grow up, and it's Pokemon style. It didn't have much. It didn't have any gameplay. <sighs> but um, you put your characters down, and they grew up, and they fought. And 
uh, we learned something interesting about that. On that particular one, it was the first time that we intentionally made things go right up to the user's face. So when the characters fought with each other, it'd be saying kapow, boom, and the the words would fly right up to your face, and we'd watch people like, oh, yeah. I do these, yeah, these reactions where they jerk back or they put their hand out and try to grab at them, <laughs> which was was kind of cool. Uh, and then our other experience was a modified version of that zombie game where we used Xbox controllers. We felt it was important that we showed that you can use your own input devices with this system. So okay. we had a two-player game with Xbox controllers, and uh, you chased each other around the the maze, and it used our really big a big piece of this retro reflector, so you could have this huge map that you could just look around and peer over walls and see the other player, and the whole map scrolled too. So that's that's something we haven't mentioned. Like the map doesn't have to be fixed. You can have oh, things neat. scrolling. So like your character was just blocked in the middle of the play field, and the the map scrolled around. But if you wanted to see where the other player was, you could duck down. You could look across the entire map, so you could peer across and see where the other player was. So it became oh, wow. became a very interesting game where people would. They'd be kind of standing up and focused on their character because zombies are attacking them. But occasionally, when they had a little clear moment, they would start peering around, <laughs> looking across the the map for. Um, nice. uh, after Maker Fair, a lot of people came up with tons of game experiences and and non-game experiences that we had never thought of, like data visualization. There's a lot of um, it's a display on your head, so. Um, wherever you put this reflector material, you have a display. So it's like a monitor, and it's just this inexpensive cardboard stuff. Hmm. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see uh, as soon as we can get some early units out to developers, see what um, interesting things they come up with. They're going to come up with stuff that we've never even imagined. Like we're just getting the audio stuff going right now, which is awesome. It's like if you put your head near a character. Since we know where your head position is, we can change the audio relative to, like if your character has chains and he's just doing his idle animation, mm -hmm. and the chains are are clanging together, you can get down close and, and listen to those chains. Or We think there could be even gameplay where um, maybe there's virtually no graphics at all. You're just using your head position in audio to do things. Mm -hmm. There are games like that now where you can create sounds by moving things around. You could definitely do that with your head. That would be neat, too. Yeah. <laughs> We've done some... <laughs> Sorry, I'm blabbing on. But no, we, it's exciting. <laughs> we've uh, we've made some sculpting, some very very simple sculpting things where you can use the wand, you can sculpt clay, voxel clay, um, just to demonstrate that you know we have one to one pixel control in 3D volume, so you just poke at things, and so uh, there's probably some productivity applications for this where you know you want to render or view a rendered 3D object. Oh yeah, this artists will go crazy. I mean, essentially now you can paint digitally without having to use your little stylus. You can use your hands again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just add a connect or some depth sensing camera to it. and and then Or, or there's actually this leap motion thing that's out there that d measures your hand position, which is looks really promising. It would probably be pretty sweet for this. How long did this take you to create? So, um... I think the first prototype of this was about this time last year, and it was huge. And I, I can see why people had trouble with understanding where it was going, because being in a software company that knows nothing about the process of doing hardware, they were people were mortified by some of the prototypes that we showed them. So the first prototype was these giant projectors on a this headband thing, <laughs> weighed like a ton. It had this cable that was uh, probably two inches in diameter and weighed like a pound <laughs> hanging off your head. And we just demonstrated that you could project uh, stereoscopic images onto the surface. And of course, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is it. This is how we can do inexpensive AR glasses. And it was difficult getting people to rally behind that. So uh, around September, October of last year, I miniaturized down, made a really clunky version of a miniaturized version that was like, it was still really heavy. But uh, we built that one, and we used that one for months and months just working on game experiences because we wanted to prove game experiences in this input device and and so that was our focus because we knew we needed to show gameplay to the Valvers and uh, and actually you know we were just working on the super lightweight version and the prior to the super lightweight version so there's like 
smaller versions we showed at Maker Faire, and then there's the super lightweight ones. So those were all in the pipeline just before we got laid off. So it was kind of neat that, you know, a few weeks afterwards, like, all these parts came back, and it just went together and worked. And it's like, <laughs> wow, it's just too bad they didn't get to see it, you know, when it was, you know, coming together. If they're waiting in line an hour, I think they were pretty impressed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm, I'm proud. I'm really, really proud. You know, I, we could have gave up, but we're going for it. I don't know where it's going to go. Um, we're pioneering something new, and uh, it's, it's, it's great working with Rick. It was great working at Valve under the uh, guidance of, of software folks that really are all about game experience, because it changed my focus from this tech. You know, I can easily get like, focused on, like, you know, how sub millimeter accurate I can track things and have no gameplay behind it. They beat it into us like gameplay. What's the gameplay? Mm -hmm. So slowly we start coming up with this whole story of the gameplay and actually thought through like, you know, what our input devices should be to get this gameplay. And I think it's very wide reaching. I mean I can see this in many, many fields that have nothing to do with gaming, but that's exciting. Um, taking a pause from what other things at Maker Faire did you see? Because I've never been, and it sounds very exciting. You seem to go all the time and see all these creative inventions. Anything else that you saw that was uh, catching your eye? I didn't get to leave the booth once. <laughs> I, I, it was, yeah, I didn't get to leave. The, the prototypes were so delicate that, you know, the first prototypes we showed, the first ones you saw were on little handles, like sticks. We took the arms off the glasses. Mm. Our thought was like most people would not be all that interested, and they would just look at it um, briefly and put minutes. it down. Uh -huh. And then we had like the full experience where you put the glasses on, and we talked people through it, and it ended up just packed the entire time. So I didn't get out and see anything. I did get to see my favorite thing: the, the cupcake uh, cars. They're like pedal-powered cars. They look like giant cupcakes, and you wear <gasps> like a little hat that's like a cherry. They're uh -huh. there every year. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> yeah. Very good. I, I love Maker Faire. It's like, it's like, in, it's the one in Silicon Valley, so it's like all the nerds are concentrated in that area. So you get the nerdiest projects, and it's, it's a lot of times it's a chance for us, you know, tech people to like express our artistic side. So like last year I made a guitar that was made out of an old Commodore 64 computer. It was a bass guitar. <laughs> so I just took a guitar and mated it to the C64, and then I took a, uh, the original sound chip from the C64 and I made sure that all the audio went through the original 8-bit sound chip and then the, the keys on the keyboard which was the keyboard was the body of the guitar was an actual play playable um, keytar so you would punch the buttons and it would play notes and I've seen videos of this and I've missed you at every single con you Jessica I've missed you anytime there's a con. It just it never works out. I'm always looking for you. Like, where's the girl with the guitar and the crazy? Were you at, at PAX this yes, year? Yes, I was at PAX. Oh, I was there. <laughs> I know. I was looking. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so that's kick, a big... Kickstarter. Do you have a, a projection on when you might uh, present this for Kickstarter? So, um, I, I want to qualify that with... Um, my background is in toy design, and we're analyzing every in and out of this product. Um, we think we've driven all the cost out, um, made some good trade-offs to keep the cost right where we want it to be, but really what we're doing right now is we want to confirm that all of our choices are right. Like we're using, uh, we're going to be doing a, a single chip that does everything on the glasses, so uh, I'm making sure that that's actually feasible and that there's not going to be any thermal problems and I just want to make sure that all the, mm -hmm. every aspect is right before we go to, to Kickstarter. We've had a lot of investors like wanting to come give us money, um, but we've been pushing them away because we're self-funding it right now. We, uh, they're, they're coming with these terms that are ridiculous and I think that, I think the product, unlike a lot of other things that we've seen on Kickstarter before, we've really thought it through and we thought about the price, we can deliver on it. Um, so I think it stands on its own, and I think people will um, respond to that because it works, and we, we show it. And We've always been very careful with production lines, and I remember the stories. So, yeah, for something this yeah. large, I guess you do have to think it through a little more than maybe shipping 200 of them. 
Exactly. The, the amount of work it takes to ship, say, a thousand versus